In this presentation, we will discuss audit planning stages. You'll recall that we broke out the audit into support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course, each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it stages in prior presentations, those stages including client acceptance or continuance, preliminary engagement activities, plan the audit, consider and audit internal controls, audit business processes and related accounts, complete the audit and then evaluate results and issue audit report. We here are going to be focusing in on these top three items, these top three client acceptance or continuance preliminary engagement uh, activities, and then of course the planning of the audit. This is all the stuff that oftentimes gets overlooked and which is very important. And this is the stuff that usually the top uh, management team or the top components of the audit staff, including the partner and senior, uh, the senior auditors are gonna be involved in the planning process because that's gonna set the stage for what's gonna be uh, happening going through the, the audit going forward. So the planning, is going to be very important and then we're going to get into the actual process of course of conducting the audit after that planning stage takes place what's going to happen within the planning stage the accounting firm should determine the following items before accepting a new client so first of all we want to think about should we accept a client as uh, someone that we want to do business with because of course we are reviewing the client but we were hoping to issue a clean report everybody wants to issue a clean report and in order to do that, we want to be engaging with clients that we expect to uh, be good clients and that they have integrity and whatnot so that we can issue a clean report. So it's very important, very important for us to then be taking on clients and uh, going through some type of process to vet them <laughs> before we start the process of audit engagements so that uh, we save ourselves any kind of time of wasted time uh, in the auditing process, because if we go through a, a, an audit with a client that is not does not have integrity, and we wait, put a lot of time into it, they're probably not going to be very happy at all to have a report at the end of the day that is not a you know a clean report, or that if we decide that we have to remove ourselves from the audit, we can't complete it because of scope limitations or an adverse report. Of course, that's not going to be good for for either party, and it's not going to basically continue on with the auditing process. So really important. And usually the people that are going to be involved here, of course, are the top level of the CPA firm, including the partner in evaluating what type of clients they should be picking up. Do we have the ability to perform the engagement? So first of all, of course, we want to be able to think, do we have the ability to do the work? You might think, hey, we're a CPA firm. Of course, we have the ability to do the work. But to consider this, we, we, we might have different types of industries and whatnot that this uh, company is in. If we have never done, say, the construction industry or retail type of industry, and we don't know the details of it, those could be constraints. Now that we could look into those constraints, get the research, then the question is, do we want to do the research in order to bring ourselves up to par in order to perform this engagement? There also could be limitations in terms of what if they have locations outside of where we are at? We are a local firm. What if they have locations in states that we don't have um, any presence in? How can we get around those limitations? Do we Can we get around those? We could work with other firms possibly to get around those types of limitations as well, but it's important for us to, to assess whether or not we have the ability and that's gonna be dependent from client to client. Are we and the company in compliance with relevant ethical uh, requirements? So are we in compliance with any kind of ethical requirements that are gonna be within the engagement process, including the standards for the engagement process, the normal business ethical uh, standards, as well as standards with regards for, to us conducting the audit, including things like uh, independence. And we'll talk about more about what those are in future presentations. Does the client have sufficient integrity to do business with? 
And this is really important because again, we don't want to be picking up clients that are gonna be problem clients. We're not picking up clients in order to say, hey, we, we're gonna audit anyone, we'll pick up any type of audit. And if the audit's good, we issue a good opinion. If the audit's bad, we issue a bad opinion. That's not really how it works. You would think kind of that would be how it works because you think audits is a type of regulation. You would think that everybody should be audited and you should just basically issue whatever opinion is there. But note who is hiring the auditor again. The auditor is being hired by, in essence, the board of directors, in essence, the business. Everybody w that is involved is expecting, hoping to have basically a clean op opinion. The CPA firm has to not give a, a clean opinion if the evidence gives the fact that there is some kind of qualification or something like that. Uh, but they don't, they don't want to basically do that. We would like to say, hey, we're dealing with someone with integrity. They put the financial statements in accordance with the way they said they were. The assertions that they told us that they made the financial statements are indeed the way they made the financial statements in. And if, if clients don't have integrity, if a company doesn't have integrity, they're going to have problems getting a qualified or a CPA firm with a good reputation to audit to audit their, their financial statements. And of course, that's going to be a problem for uh, the company. So note that the job of the CPA firm isn't to pick up any client and basically, you know, audit audit the client. And if it comes out, it is what it is. It comes out what it is. And we issue the report. If it's good, it's good. It's bad. It's bad. We want to be independent and issue the report. If it's good, it's good. It's bad. It's bad. However, we want to see as much as possible that if we see that there's going to be bad reports that need to be issued in the front uh, side of things as we take on new clients, we don't go forward with the audit. It's not cost effective for ourselves or the client to do so. We say, hey, this isn't, I don't think this is an audit we're going to move forward with. I'm not sure that the client has the integrity for us to want to pick up this engagement. It's simply not worth our time to go through the engagement with a high risk possibly of uh, a not a not uh, good result. And we don't want continuing engagements with clients that are going to be difficult for us to, <laughs> to work with. So it's going to be very important. Again, that's going to be one of the principal jobs of, of obviously the partners to deal with the, the new clients and what type of clients are going to be picking up. Do we have the ability to perform the engagement? So that could be including things like, do we have the technical skill and knowledge of industry and subject matter? So a lot of CPA firms will be focusing in on certain niches especially if we're not in the in the largest CPA firms, even large CPA firms are, are going to have different departments that focus in on different industry niches. Smaller CPA firms often find a niche they do business by focusing in on a specific niche. And so if we then see clients or have an opportunity to take clients outside of that niche, then we want to say, hey, do I have the resources? Do I want to take on the resources, uh, you know, get myself up to par to pick up whatever needs to be picked up in order to take on the engagement? Do we have employees with experience and relevant uh, regulatory and reporting requirement of regulatory uh, reporting requirements? So note, in different industries are gonna have different types of requirements. And there's a lot of different types of audits we, we might be engaged in. We might be auditing, for example, for a specific type of reason. For example, we might be auditing on a state level for like an HOA, a homeowners association or something like that in accordance with requirements for that state that's necessary to have for those specific uh, requirements, which might need us then to know what those requirements are, which which could differ than our other types of niches. So we need to know, do we have the people involved that that know these regulations and what what is needed within the audit? Do we have the necessary personnel uh, with competence and abilities? Do we have the people we need to uh, finish and conduct the audit in accordance with whatever special needs that audit is? Do we Do we have or can we get specialists as needed? So we often might need specialists in, in different ways, because if we're going to do things, say, evaluate uh, the value of certain type of assets, we might say have inventory that we don't know how to value, uh, we, we, because obviously we're auditors. And if we're trying to say, is the inventory on the books at the correct value, we can go out and count the inventory as auditors. That's not hard. We could say there's that many units of inventory, but valuing the inventory, not ver not very easy to value like clothing or something like that. if if we're an auditor <laughs> it'd be different so we might have need specialists and different types of areas are going to need specialists for certain types of reasons question is do we have those specialists are we willing to to find those specialists for as needed uh can we do the work on time obviously again th there's going to be scope limitations with these things and and we want to make sure that uh, when we take on the new engagement what's going to be the time frame of it 
And given all this, this type of information, can we do it within a reasonable time frame for both our purposes and the purposes of uh, the client that we are doing business with? Are we and the company in compliance with relevant ethical uh, requirements? Uh, are we independent? That's going to be one of the key components. So when we think about ethical requirements, and we'll talk more about independence as we go, but one key thing is we want to be independent. And notice what we're doing here. We're, we're giving our opinion on the financial statements in order for a, th a third party, two business people, to do business and be able to rely and trust on each other. Uh, in order to do that, we need to be independent. And the best thing would be to be d independent not not just in 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 form and in substance we want to basically say hey we did our job it's not enough in other words for us to say look we did our job we're a cpa firm we did our job i'm a cpa and it were trust me i'm i'm independent even though in appearance i i may not be so for example i might be on the board of directors if i if i was a cpa on the board of directors of the company that we audited it may well be that i was independent in my conduct that I performed the audit in an independent fashion and I didn't let that influence my opinion at all but the appearance doesn't look independent and of course the appearance matters when you're talking about a third party if I'm going to some third party and I say yeah I audited the financial statements of this company and on oh, by the way I'm on the board of that company and I'm an auditor and I'm a substantial shareholder of it the, I may have done a great job of the audit, but the, the other person is not going to help build their trust as much as, as if I can say, hey, you know, I'm an independent auditor and I have, I'm not on the board. I don't own any stock in this company. I'm independent both in appearance and substance. And I'm also regulated by, you know, the rules of being independent as a CPA firm. Then that's what's going to give more assurance. So when the, the problem with independence oftentimes for most people's mind is to say, hey, that doesn't bias my opinion it doesn't bias my opinion that i know people on on the in the company or that i that i have you know siblings that work there or something like that it doesn't bother that i still give an, a, an opinion that's valid because i'm a truthful person but in appearance it doesn't look good and therefore that could still harm the the quality of the opinion and so then we also can we accept the client uh, without violating any regulatory requirements or the code of professional conduct. So we want to be able to obviously accept the clients without violating any kind of code of, co code of conduct. Does the client have sufficient integrity to do business with? So some questions we might ask with regard to that. And again, any kind of client that doesn't have the sufficient integrity, we really would like to weed them out before any type of transaction, any type of engagement, because they will take a lot of time and waste a lot of time. We first need to determine and identify the reputation of the principal owners and top management. So what's going to be the reputation? Understand the nature of the client's operation and business practices. Determine the attitude towards internal controls and uh, interpretation of accounting standards. And this is going to be a big one because when we start to sit down and think about with the top management, what do you think about internal controls? What do you think about uh, accounting standards? Do you have internal controls? How are they implemented? This is really important, especially with larger type of companies, because we're dependent on the internal controls as a major portion of our audit, as is the financial statement process typically of a well set up organization that's large is going to need uh, good internal controls. And it's possible, to, it's very possible for a good set of internal controls to have been set up, yet not implemented. And you can kind of get a feel for that about what people think about internal controls. Is it necessary to have internal controls? How well are the internal controls one made? What are the internal controls and how well are they actually uh, followed and established? And of course, setting the establishment of following internal controls is, is something that's going to be set by the top management. So you can kind of get a feel of what they think about those types of things when the discussion of top management happens to take on a new client. Determine if there are any indications of limitations on the scope of the work. In other words, when we start to think about and talk over what the engagement might look like, we want to think about what the scope limitations will be and get a feel for if there are any scope limitations involved. For example, if we start to say, hey, there's this one particular department that's over in China or something like or over in some other area, you know, we want to think about, well, how are we going to get access to that? Are there any problems with us getting getting access to that if, if the client then says, you know, you can't audit that particular department because they won't let us in or for whatever reason? 
then we're going to have some scope limitations and we want to consider those up front and, and get an idea of them as soon as possible. Determine if, if there are any indications of fraud or money laundering. Obviously, if we if we look into things and we, we start to get a feel for the idea that there might be some type of fraud, some type of illegal activity or money laundering, that would go towards the integrity of the client and we probably wouldn't want to uh, take on the engagement. Uh, the reasons for a company leaving the previous firm. Note, this is going to be a key question and it seems like one of those questions that you would think is like, that's kind of a rude question. Like, why did you leave the prior firm? But it's, it's a standard question that we have to ask. It's basically standard type of practice and of course it makes sense to have this if you're talking about a publicly traded company or any other type of company that needs an audit from a year to year point and they're looking for a new CPA firm it's natural for us in the CPA firm profession to then say who was your prior you know why why are you leaving your prior uh, CPA firm and uh, what are the what are the conditions on which you left the prior CPA firm and possibly even, you know, can we contact the prior CPA firm just to, to see what the, you know, what the conditions are there. And, and again, that's going to be typical type of thing because we want to know for our purposes and theirs, what was the problem with the engagement so that we can both know what the engagement is if we want to take on the engagement and so that we can do hopefully a better job possibly with whatever kind of uh, limitations there were within the prior engagement. So hopefully you know, they left the prior firm, possibly they got too big and they grew and they left the, the prior firm because the prior firm is small. They don't have enough regional offices and whatnot. And that would be, a, you know, a fine, uh, fine thing. But it's going to be a common question for us to go to that prior firm and ask that or to ask about the, the leaving of the prior firm and the, why you'd be looking for a new firm. If it's a new engagement and they didn't have an audit in the prior year, well, that would be self-explanatory. If they're a publicly traded company, then they would need to have an audit if they were publicly traded in prior years. Uh, if they're not publicly traded, maybe they need an audit now and they didn't need one last year. And that would be, of course, the reason they didn't have uh, an, an auditor in the prior year. Continue in client retention. Periodically evaluate client retention. Now, if we're talking about a client that's continuing, then obviously we already know about the client. We don't have to do as much evaluation, but we do want to just keep in mind those key points that things could change and things change gradually with clients. So it's easy for us to just after time, things can deteriorate and we possibly don't know it right we don't so we have to basically uh reevaluate especially when key things type type key things type happen so it's typical to evaluate near the close of the audit or if there's some significant event that happens if there's some type of event that happens we may want to reassess and say okay let's uh reevaluate this client so that we make sure that we're up to date on our evaluation of our business dealings with the client so uh, if there's any arguments for for example over fees that could cause some tension with the, the client. It could be an indication of other things going on. So we want to basically reevaluate our situation with the client at that point. That means our fees, our fees on the audit and conflicts over accounting and audit issues. If there's any conflicts, if, the, if we say, hey, there's an adjustment, this doesn't seem to line up to generally accepted accounting principles and the client is saying, no, I, I don't believe that or I'm not going to make that adjustment or I believe you're right, that doesn't line up, but I still don't want to make the adjustment because of A, B, or C. Doesn't mean they're wrong necessarily, but it does mean that we want to basically reevaluate the situation at that point and, and make sure everything is, is running smoothly and make sure that that doesn't, uh, or see if that's an indication of anything deeper.